Hello everybody, welcome back to Wicked Wildlife Wisdom. As always, I'm your host, Zero Yeti. Let's go ahead into it with the first animal of the week being the burrow, which is a breed of domestic donkey that can be found within the Iberian Peninsula, which is the Spain and Portugal part of Europe, as well as Hispanic America, particularly within Mexico, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Nicaragua. Among donkeys, burrows tend to be on the smaller side, averaging around 36 to 47 inches tall at the shoulder, 47 inches in length, and around 250 pounds in weight. Burrows have long ears, short manes, and come in a variety of colors, from black to brown to gray to red roan, with even hints of pink and blue. However, the most common coloring is that being gray with a white muzzle and white underbelly. Burrows, like all donkeys, possess strong digestive systems that can break down tough vegetation and extract moisture from it efficiently, allowing to eat allowing donkeys to eat a wider variety of plant species than horses. Additionally, they can go for long periods of time without drinking. These traits allow burrows to survive and thrive in harsh desert environments uh, where water and forage are often scarce. Burrows are highly intelligent animals, uh, and although they can run almost as fast and quick, almost as fast as horses, when faced with potential danger, burrows tend to assess the situation before fleeing. Additionally, donkeys are more than capable of defending themselves with their powerful kicks from both the front and behind legs. Their tendency to stand their ground against potential threats and predators um, makes, them efficient, uh, makes them efficient and excellent guard animals in domestic settings. The term burrow is also the Spanish and Portuguese word for donkey. Introduced into the Americas by some Spaniards in the 1500s, Burrow, like all domestic donkeys, have a long history as a work animal, often used to pull machinery and to carry both supplies and people across vast distances and rugged terrain. In Spanish, burros may also, been, may also be called the burro mexicano, or the Mexican donkey, the burro chiluro, or the chiluro donkey, or the burro chiluro mexicano. In the United States, burro is used as a loan word by English speakers to describe any small donkey used primarily as a pack animal, as well as to describe the feral donkeys that live in Arizona, California, Oregon, Utah, Texas, and Nevada. Next up is the Australian lungfish, also known as the Queensland lungfish, the burnet salmon, or the barramunda. It is the only surviving member of the family Neoceratodontidae, and is one of only six extant lung species on Earth. While it, while it is native only to the Maori and Burnett River systems in the southeastern Queensland, part of Queensland in Australia, it has been successfully introduced to other more southerly rivers such as the Brisbane, the Albert, the Stanley, the Coomera, and the Inogira Reservoir throughout the past century. Here, the Australian lungfish prefer slow-moving or still waters with a muddy or sandy bottom and plenty of vegetation. Additionally, they can be often found in small groups around submerged logs, logs or in deep rocky pools. In the wild, its prey includes frogs, tadpoles, salamanders, small fishes, a variety of invertebrates, and various plants. These up to 5 foot long, 95 pound fish sport small eyes, flattened heads, and stout elongated bodies that are olive green or dull brown on the, black, on the back, sides, and tail, as well as the fins. With males sporting dark red markings on the underside, while females typically sport pale yellow or orange markings. A distinctive characteristic of the Australian lungfish is the presence of a single dorsal lung, used to supplement oxygen supply through the gills. During times of excessive activity, uh, drought, or high temperatures when water becomes deoxygenated, the lungfish can rise to the surface and swallow air into its lung. Unlike other lungfish species, the Australian lungfish is not an obligate air breather and often prefers to still utilize its well-developed gills. Because of this, the Australian lungfish cannot survive complete desiccation of its habitat like other lungfish species can, but it can still live out of water for several days if the surface of its skin remains constantly moist. A rather long-lived species, fish species, uh, they are capable of reaching upwards of 80 years in age, uh, particularly in captive specimens. 
Uh, the Australian lungfish is also slow to reproduce, reaching sexual maturity around 20 years of age. This slow growth, coupled with the low survival rate of its eggs and fry, mean the Australian lungfish faces increased risk of population decline, particularly due to human development and habitat destruction. With the lungfish currently being listed as a protective, protected but endangered species throughout all of its range. Next up is the crested partridge, also known as the crested wood partridge, the root rule, the red crowned wood partridge, the green wood quail, or the green wood partridge. It is a game bird in the pheasant family, Phasinanidae, of the order Galliformes. It is the only member of its genus, Rolumus. The small, rotund, short tailed bird measures around between 9 and 10 inches in length, with males being marginally larger than females. Both sexes have a scarlet patch of bare skin around the eye and red legs without a spur on the, or hind toe. The male is metallic green above with, uh, above with glossy dark blue underparts and brownish wing panels. The head is adorned with a tall red crest, white forehead spot, and black frontal bristles. The female is a pea green has pea green body plumage with a slate gray head complex with bristles but no spot or crest. Younger birds typically sport duller versions of the adult colors. The crested partridge is usually seen singularly or in pairs and often uses its feet to probe the forest floor for fruit seeds and vertebrates. And like other partridges, when disturbed, the crested partridge prefers to run, but if necessary, it flies a short distance with its rounded wings. This bird is a resident breeder throughout the lowland rainforest of Burma, Thailand, Malaysia, Sumatra, and Borneo, and pairs typically work together to create a nest by scraping a small divot into the earth, uh, which is then concealed under a heap of leaf, leaf, leaf litter. At complexion, the female typically lays uh, five to six white eggs, which are then incubated for 18 days. Uh, another nor another Interesting fact about the crested partridge, it has been seen uh, with both Sumatran and Javan rhinos picking parasites and generally cleaning up the animal, sort of in a similar vein to how oxpeckers do with African rhino species. Uh, however, unlike oxpeckers, they have not been noted, noted as creating wounds or picking out scabs to drink the blood or eat the dead flesh off the rhinos, prefer instead just to eat the insects surrounding them. Next up is the red spitting cobra, which is a species of spitting cobra native throughout East Africa, including Djibouti, Eritrea, Somalia, Kenya, northern e southern Egypt, northern Tanzania, eastern Ethiopia, and northern Sudan. It primarily inhabits dry savanna and semi-desert areas up to 3,900 feet in elevation. These snakes can typically be found within termite mounds, old logs, or bush piles or burrows near water sources where they hunt toads, frogs, rodents, birds, and other snakes. These two and a half to four and a half foot long snakes can be easily differentiated from other cobras by their distinctive coloration and marking. Their bodies are typically bright salmon red color in color contrasted with a broad black band around their throats and subocular teardrop markings. However, the color of the species does have variation with specimens from southern Kenya and northern Tanzania uh, sporting an orange-red color with a broad dark blue or black throat band, and some Ethiopian specimens sporting two or three throat bands. When threatened, the cobra rears up and displays a typical cobra hood and hisses loudly to make itself seem as dangerous as possible. If the intruder does not retreat, it will then spray jets of venom from its fangs uh, into the face of the intruder. This venom contains a potent mixture of neurotoxins and cytotoxins that, while being rarely fatal to humans, is known to cause burning pain, tissue damage, and, which can result in disfigurement and blindness. Next up is the Japanese rhinoceros beetle, also known as the Japanese horn beetle. It is a species of rhinoceros beetle native throughout Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and China. It can be found throughout temperate and tropical cloud forests where it typically feeds on a variety of sugary foods such as nectar, tree sap, and fruit. 
Japanese rhinoceros beetles show striking sexual dimorphism with two with their two three and a half inch long males often reaching nearly double the size of the one and a half to two inch long females. Additionally, males sport a characteristic long Y-shaped horn that they utilize to compete with other males for both mates and territories. They do so by using their forked horn to lift the opposing male off the ground and then throw them into the air. Like other beetles, the Japanese rhinoceros beetle spends most of its life underground in its larval form. After the eggs are laid in late September or early October, it spends several months in its larval form uh, eating roots and other detritus in the earth before maturing and emerging sometime during, late, during the late spring period as an adult. But its life as an adult is short-lived with less than four months because in less than four months, the beetles will find and defend both mates and territory, usher in a new generation, and then pass away come the first major freezes of autumn and winter. Additionally, the Japanese rhinoceros beetle is popular both as a pet and in gambling, especially on the Ryukyu Islands, where people utilize them in a similar manner to Siamese fighting fish and battling crickets. And the most popular game featuring the beetles, the two different male beetles are placed on a log and battle each other by trying to push each other off the log, uh, with the one to stay on the log deemed the winner. Next up is the blue spot ribbon tail ray, which is a species of stingray in the family Dystodiidae. It can be found in the tropical waters of the Red Sea, Persian Gulf, Indian, and Western Pacific Oceans from the intertidal zone to depths of over 100 feet. Uh, the here prefers to live in live in and around coral reefs and seagrass beds, spending the day hidden alone inside caves under coral edges. At night, small groups of these rays assemble and swim into the shallow sandy flats with the rising tide to feed on to feed by excavating the sand to uncover mollusks, polychaete worms, shrimps, crabs, and small benthic bony fishes. The blue spot ribbon tail ray is itself a frequent prey source for hammerhead sharks and bottlenose dolphins. At 14 inches wide, 30 inches long, and 11 pounds in weight, it is a fairly small ray with, mostly, with a mostly smooth oval pectoral fin disc. Large protruding eyes and a relatively short and thick tail with a deep fin fold underneath. It can be easily identified from other rays by its striking color pattern of many electric blue spots on a yellowish background uh, with a pair of blue stripes on the tail. The tail barb is venomous and while it isn't particularly deadly to humans, it is capable of leaving a nasty and painful wound. Breeding in the blue spot ribbon tail ray occurs in late spring to su early summer and courtship starts with one stingray following around and nipping at the disc of another, eventually biting and holding onto them for prolonged copulation. Like other stingrays, this species is aplacental viparous, with embryos being initially sustained by the yolk, which later in development is supplemented by the hysteroph, or uterine milk, which is produced by the mother. The gestation period is uncertain, but it is thought to be between 4 and 12 months long, and females bear litters of up to 7 young, each, with, each looking like a miniature version of the adults, measuring around 5 inches across. And our extinct animal of the week is the cave bear, Ursus spileus. This was a species of bear that lived throughout Europe and Asia during the Pleistocene era throughout the last glacial maximum until around 12,000 years ago. Both the word for cave and the scientific name spileus are used because fossils of the species are predominantly found in caves, reflecting the views of experts that these cave bears spent more time in caves than modern bears which typically only utilize the caves for hibernation. Cave bears are more comparable in size with the largest known modern-day brown bears, weighing between 1,000 and 2,000 pounds in weight and standing over 5 foot tall at the shoulder when, all, when on all fours, and then over 11 feet in height when rearing. Cave bears notably lack the usual 2 to 3 premolars present in other bear species. To compensate for this, the last molar is very elongated with additional cusps. In general, cave bear teeth were very large and show greater wear than most modern bear species, uh, suggesting a diet of tough materials such as tubers, berries, grasses, insects, and bone.
From this diet, we can infer that Ursus phileus was primarily a grazer and an opportunistic scavenger. Despite their tremendous strength and opposing size, the cave bear was not free of predators, with packs of wolves and cave hyenas proving more than capable of taking down a sick or infirm individual. Notably, the presence of fully articulated adult cave lion skeletons deep within cave bear dens indicates that the lions often entered the dens to prey on the hibernating cave bears. This is not without danger, however, as even the hibernating bear can put up a serious fight and many lions lost their lives in the attempt to slay the giants. Interestingly enough, there is evidence that the cave bear may have played a significant role in the culture and spirituality of Paleolithic humans, particularly Neanderthals. As there have been several Neanderthal inhabitation sites throughout Europe, in which remains of dozens of cave bears, particularly their skulls, um, that were utilized as both tools and ceremonial artifacts, often showing evidence of being well cared for. It is unknown what exactly caused the extinction of the cave bear, uh, but a change in climate, a decrease in food availability, and competition with humans for caves in which to live likely played a factor in the cave bear's ultimate demise. As always, take care to my guys, gals, non-binary pals.